Hi, this is Matt Baker. From a very young age, I was aware of the fact that my maternal grandfather, who I knew as Papa Hutt, had fought during World War II. He had this photo of his unit hanging in his house, and I would sometimes see him dressed up like this on his way to attend reunions or Remembrance Day ceremonies. But for some reason, even when I was older and starting to get interested in history, I never actually took the time to learn about the people, places, and events that were a part of his wartime service. I knew that he was a member of a group called the West Novies and that he had served in Europe. But beyond that, I knew very little. Well, recently, I decided to change that. So today, I'm going to share with you what I've learned. And I'd like to dedicate this video to him. Let's start on September the 10th, 1939. That's the day that Canada declared war on Germany, one week after the United Kingdom did. At this point, Canada's armed forces consisted of around 8,000 members on active duty, with an extra 60,000 in reserve. Contrast that to the end of the war, at which point there were over 1 million Canadians on active duty representing around 40% of all men aged 18 to 45 at the time. Almost all of the Canadians who served during World War II were volunteers, and my grandfather was among the first, enlisting in September 1939 at the age of 19. He was from Nova Scotia, so he joined a regiment in Halifax called the Halifax Rifles. However, this unit was initially tasked with local protection duties, which my grandfather found disappointing because he desperately wanted to join the fight overseas. Another Nova Scotia unit, called the West Nova Scotia Regiment, was sent to Europe in December 1939. So sometime in early 1940, my grandfather asked to be transferred to them. Thus, on May 22, 1940, he was among the 100-plus reinforcements to join the West Novies, who by then were stationed in Aldershot, England the home of the British Army. This was just a few days before the start of the famous Dunkirk rescue, in which over 300,000 Allied soldiers were evacuated from France after having been surrounded by the German army. The battle for France was still ongoing, though, so on June the 13th, the West Novies were given orders to head to the coast, where they would soon be transported to the continent. But that never happened because the very next day, June the 14th, Paris fell to the Nazis, and then eight days later, on June 22nd, France surrendered. This meant that the Axis powers now basically controlled the entire continent of Europe. It also meant that my grandfather would spend the next three years in England before he would finally see action. Now, before I continue, I want to show you how you can find out information about your own ancestors, including those who may have fought in World War II. Thanks to today's sponsor, MyHeritage, it's actually quite easy. MyHeritage gives you access to over 19 billion records, including military documents and newspapers. For example, I found this article about the Battle of Ortona, which I'll be talking about later in this video. I also found this census record from 1931, which includes my grandfather's name when he was just 10 years old. It also includes the names of his father and mother, who are my great-grandparents. Using this information, I was able to make a simple family tree using the MyHeritage website's easy-to-use family tree maker. From there, the website automatically gave me discovery links so that I could grow my tree even further. So if you'd like to do something similar for your own family, sign up for a 14-day free trial of MyHeritage right now by clicking the link in the description or pinned comment. As a Useful Charts viewer, you also qualify for 50% off a premium membership. Okay, let me now return to my grandfather's story. At this point, I think it would be useful for me to explain a bit about how military units are organized, and in particular, how some of Canada's infantry units were organized during World War II. Let's start with the word regiment. During World War II, Canadian infantry regiments were equal to one battalion which is a unit that consists of around 1,000 soldiers. However, the more important feature of a regiment is the fact that most of its members usually come from the same geographical area, which is something that helps build camaraderie within the group. As I've already mentioned, my grandfather's regiment was from Nova Scotia and was called the West Nova Scotia Regiment, or West Novies for short. 
When several regiments are combined, they are known as a brigade. During World War II, the West Novies belonged to the 3rd Canadian Infantry Brigade, which also included the Royal 22nd Regiment, also known as the Vandus, as they were a French unit from Quebec, as well as the Carlton and York Regiment from New Brunswick. So basically, the 3rd Brigade consisted of men from Eastern Canada. The 1st and 2nd Brigades also consisted of three regiments each, representing men from Ontario and Western Canada, respectively. When several brigades are combined, they are known as a division. In this case, these three brigades, together with some specialty units, made up the 1st Canadian Division, which consisted of around 10,000 soldiers. Being that it was the first group of Canadian soldiers to arrive in Europe, it was initially commanded directly by Canada's top general at the time, Andrew McNaughton. However, within a year, a second Canadian division was sent as well, and eventually a third, fourth, and fifth. So take note that when two or more divisions are combined, they are called a corps. And when several corps are combined, they are called an army. My grandfather was in the same regiment, brigade, and division throughout the war. But the corps and army he belonged to changed according to the situation. So with that information in mind, let me now return to the situation in 1940. Remember, in June of that year, France was defeated, leaving the Axis with complete control of the continent. What happened next was the Battle of Britain in which Germany launched large-scale air attacks on England in the hopes of forcing a peace agreement or to set the stage for a full-scale invasion of the UK. Therefore, starting in July of 1940, most of the main British Army divisions were placed along the southern coast of Great Britain. The 1st Canadian Division, however, was placed a little bit more inland in order to help serve as a second line of defence. Initially, the 1st Canadian Division was a part of the British Seven Corps, with the Canadian General Andrew McNaughton being put in charge of the entire corps. However, once the 2nd Canadian Division arrived, it was renamed as the Canadian Corps, and it remained as such for the next year and a half. During this period, the West Novies were assigned to the village of East Horsley, and then later Waldingham, where they were billeted with local families. But it wasn't a time of just relaxing and hanging about. The soldiers were constantly participating in training exercises, war games, and patrolling. In fact, on August 15, 1940, the West Novies became the first Canadian regiment to take a German airman prisoner after the RAF shot down several enemy bombers and one German crew member parachuted right down into their camp. However, by the next year, 1941, it was clear that the Germans were not going to be able to successfully invade Great Britain. So instead, in June, the Germans turned their attention towards Russia, initiating Operation Barbarossa. This was also the point in the war when Jews started to be killed en masse in Eastern Europe. Unfortunately, this included many members of my wife's family. Earlier this year, I actually did a video about her family tree and how it was severely impacted by the Holocaust. I'll leave a link to that in the description. 1941 was also the year that World War II expanded to include the Pacific Theater. On December the 7th, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, as well as several other places, such as Hong Kong, where two Canadian regiments were located. This turn of events resulted in the United States finally joining the Allies. But back to Europe. By the end of 1941, the West Novies were moved to the coast of Great Britain, near Brighton, where they helped take over the primary line of defence. Their rigorous training continued there, and unfortunately, on January the 6th, 1942, the regiment lost its first men on active duty, when six soldiers drowned during a training exercise. An even larger tragedy occurred for Canada later that year, although it did not directly involve my grandfather's regiment. On August 19, 1942, the second Canadian division was chosen to be the main unit involved in the raid of Dieppe, France, in order to test the feasibility of a large-scale invasion on the continent. Although vital intelligence was gained, the operation proved to be a disaster, with over half of the Canadians being either killed, wounded, or captured within the first 10 hours. However, back in the UK, 
Canadian reinforcements continued to arrive, and by this point, the single Canadian Corps had been upgraded to the size of a full army, now consisting of two corps, labeled 1 and 2. The war was also finally starting to turn in favor of the Allies, with the Germans failing to capture Stalingrad. By May 1943, the Allies had also obtained victory in North Africa. This set the stage for a major invasion of Italy, which Winston Churchill famously called the soft underbelly of the Axis. The goal was to force the Germans to pull troops away from Russia, but also from France, so that the Allies could eventually launch D-Day. The British wanted to include a Canadian division in the assault on Italy, but General McNaughton, now commanding a full, all-Canadian army, did not want to break up his forces. In the end, though, he relented, and the 1st Canadian Division was assigned to Italy. Now, keep in mind that on the ground, the everyday soldier often did not know where they were going until the last moment. Thus, when the 1st Canadian Division was sent to Scotland in May 1943 for mountain training, they thought maybe they were going to be sent to Norway. Even when they were issued tropical kits, some thought that maybe it was just a ploy. But soon, they were aboard the Polish ship, the MS Battery, where they eventually learned they were headed to the Mediterranean. The invasion would start on the island of Sicily, with an amphibious attack called Operation Husky. Although it was overall smaller than the more famous D-Day landings at Normandy, Operation Husky actually involved putting more troops on the beaches in a single day. In charge of the entire operation was the future U.S. president, Dwight Eisenhower. However, two separate armies were involved, the U.S. 7th Army, led by George Patton, and the British 8th Army, led by Bernard Montgomery. Here's how the West Novies fit in. Inside the British 8th Army was the British 30 Corps, and inside the 30 Corps was the 1st Canadian Division. And as I've already mentioned, inside the 1st Canadian Division was the 3rd Infantry Brigade, and inside the 3rd Infantry Brigade was the West Novies. The West Novies, of course, could be broken down into smaller units as well. It was divided into five main companies, H, Q, and then A, B, C, and D companies. My grandfather was a member of H, Q. However, it too was broken down further into the Signals Platoon, responsible for communications, and the Admin Platoon, responsible for things like arranging transport, giving out supplies, and keeping records. My grandfather was in the admin platoon, which served him well after the war because it meant that he was qualified to work as a civil servant, which is what he ended up doing. But this does not mean that he wasn't involved in the actual fighting. Soldiers in HQ platoons carried rifles and engaged with the enemy when necessary. Much of the admin work took place only during downtimes. The invasion of Sicily started on July 10, 1942 with the 1st Canadian Division now being led by the up-and-coming General Guy Simmons, and the West Novies being led by a colonel named Pat Bogert. The Italians had expected the landing to take place on the north side of the island, and thus when the Allies arrived on the southern beaches, they were met with little resistance. The West Novies landed on the beach near Pacino around 4 p.m., and didn't actually come under any enemy fire until the next morning, when they were quickly able to overcome an Italian machine gun platoon and take them all prisoner. From there, the Canadians proceeded inland, with the Americans to their left and the British to their right. About a week after the landing, the regiment lost its first man in action, Lance Corporal J. Warren. Soon thereafter, on July 25th, Italy's fascist government fell, and Mussolini was arrested. This, however, did not change the situation on the ground. While many Italian soldiers were easily rounded up due to their rapidly declining morale, the West Novies mostly had to face German units, who continued to fight hard. One town that the West Novies were responsible for taking in Sicily was Catena Nuova, which ended up being their first World War II battle honor to be emblazoned on their regimental flag, together with the Sicily landing itself. As the Allies successfully took more and more towns, the Germans retreated most of their troops to the mainland, and by August, the entire island of Sicily was in Allied hands. The next step was therefore to invade the mainland itself. The Allies had not been able to land a permanent force on the continent of Europe since evacuating Dunkirk three years earlier. 
The plan was for the main force to land at Salerno, led by the U.S. 5th Army. However, in order to divert enemy forces away from Salerno, a smaller invasion would take place a week earlier, on September the 3rd at Reggio, led by the British 13th Corps, to which the 1st Canadian Division was now assigned. In fact, the West Novies, alongside the Carlton and Yorks, were first on the beach that day, meaning that my grandfather was among the first Allied soldiers to regain a foothold on the European continent. On the same day as the landing, the government of Italy actually signed a peace agreement with the Allies, although this was not announced until the 8th. The Germans responded by setting up a puppet state, mostly in northern Italy, called the National Republican State of Italy. They even managed to rescue Mussolini and put him back in charge. Meanwhile, the West Novies worked their way along the southeast coast. And then on September 17th, they participated in a surprise maneuver. The Germans were planning to make a firm stand at Potenza. But before they could do this, a special lightning-fast task force was created by temporarily reinforcing the West Novies with tanks, artillery, and machine guns. Nicknamed Beaufort, after their leader, Pat Bogart, they managed to cover 75 miles of mountainous terrain in just 60 hours, allowing them to take Potenza before the Germans had a chance to dig in. But the Germans still had a major series of defenses, called the Winter Line, just south of Rome, which consisted of the primary Gustav Line, as well as several secondary lines. This ended up splitting the Italian peninsula in two, and therefore the Allies' next task would be to break through these heavily guarded lines. The West Novies earned battle honours for fighting at many locations along the Winter Line that fall, including at Castle di Sangro, which is where this photo was taken, on November 26th, 1943. The man with the fancy hat is James Ralston, who is Canada's Minister of National Defence during most of the war. The man in the centre is Colonel Pat Bogart, commander of the West Novies, and the man just behind him is Corporal Tom Hutt, my grandfather. Which brings me to the Battle of Ortona, which occurred exactly 80 years ago this week, and which was the toughest battle fought by the West Novies during World War II, if not by the entire Canadian military. It saw the 1st Canadian Division, now led by Christopher Vokes, up against Germany's 1st Paratrooper Division which was one of its most elite and experienced units. The battle ended up being called Italy's Stalingrad because it resulted in extremely close-up combat and because it resulted in a high number of casualties. In fact, it is estimated that about a quarter of all the Canadians who died during the Italian campaign died during this one battle. According to my grandfather, he himself had two really close calls at Ortona. Once, when an artillery shell destroyed the building he was in, and another time, during heavy shooting, when he dove under a truck and felt what he thought was blood pouring all over him. Luckily, though, it was just warm water from the truck's radiator. A memorial in the town, erected by the Canadian government, describes the battle this way. In the mud and rain, troops attacked from the Moro River to Ortona. Then, from house to house and room to room, there raged a ferocious battle against resolute German defenders. With extraordinary courage, the Canadians prevailed, and just after Christmas, finally secured the town. Later in life, my grandfather was able to return to Italy and visit the graves of many of his friends who were buried near Ortona. The next few months involved a lot of slow-moving trench warfare, a bit like World War I. And it wasn't until the spring of 1944 that the Allies were able to break through the winter line for good. Now, most people, if they know anything about World War II, are familiar with D-Day, which is when the Allies launched the largest seaborne invasion in all of world history, landing at Normandy on the north coast of France. Well, in the weeks leading up to D-Day, the Allies also launched a major offensive in Italy in order to divert attention and resources away from France. In Canada, we refer to this offensive as the Battle of the Leary Valley. It started on May 11th, and soon thereafter, the Germans were forced to abandon the Gustav Line and fall back on the Hitler Line. But then on May 24th, the Hitler Line was breached as well, with the Canadians being the first to get through. This opened up the road to Rome, 
which the Americans were able to march into on June the 4th, just two days before D-Day. So while the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division was storming the beaches of Normandy and would soon be joined there by the 2nd Canadian Infantry Division, the 1st Canadian Infantry Division started to head north towards the Gothic Line, the Germans' last line of defense in Italy. Although there were many breaches made, the Gothic Line basically held until the final weeks of the war. However, one important hard-won victory along the Gothic Line occurred in September of 1944, when the 1st Canadian Division was able to capture the city of Rimini with the help of New Zealand tanks and a newly formed unit of Greek soldiers, specially trained for mountain warfare. I've only ever seen my grandfather cry once, and it was when he described to me what happens when a tank gets hit. Without going into the detail, let's just say that the people inside rarely get out alive. While the 1st Canadian Division did most of their fighting in Italy, they did not actually stay there until the end of the war. In March of 1945, a secret troop movement known as Operation Goldflake took place, in which all of the Canadian soldiers in Italy were quietly moved by convoy, boat, and train to northwest Europe, where they were reunited with the rest of the Canadian Army, now led by General Harry Creer. Thus, during the final weeks of the war, my grandfather served in France, Belgium, Germany, and then finally the Netherlands. There, the Canadians helped liberate several Dutch towns, during which time, on April 28th, the West Novies lost their last man during the war, Private F. Fitzgerald. That brought the total up to 352 West Novies who made the ultimate sacrifice. On May the 7th, at 8 o'clock in the morning, the regiment was located in the Dutch town of Neekerk when a message arrived stating that the war was officially over. The next day, May the 8th, was celebrated as VE Day, meaning Victory in Europe. The West Novies rode from Neykerk to The Hague that day, but the convoy was forced to move very slowly at many points due to the fact that crowds of Dutch citizens kept rushing into the streets to celebrate and to thank the soldiers for their service. Once at The Hague, the West Novies spent the next few weeks helping to disarm the Germans. The enemy's rifles were piled up into large heaps, and more than 7,000 German soldiers were led into the West Novi's cages, where they waited until they were sent back to Germany on May the 27th. As for the Nova Scotians, they remained in the Netherlands until September, during which time they were prepared for repatriation. It wasn't until October the 1st, 1945, that the West Nova Scotia Regiment finally arrived back home to Halifax, aboard the SS Ile de France. They paraded along some of the main streets before the crowds started rushing towards the men, women and relatives desperately trying to find their loved ones. Over the next year, my grandfather fell in love with my grandmother, and by early 1947, the couple was married. Two years after that, my mother was born. So that was a look at what I learned about my grandfather's experiences during World War II. Let me know in the comments if any of your ancestors fought in the war, and if so, where they served, and perhaps even in which unit. Thanks for watching.